Don't go. Fuck this. Let's start where I think the story starts. That way we won't lose consciousness in mid-sentence or accidentally start a war. So when the topic of North Korea arose, Joe Biden knew exactly what to do. Every day you're waking up and you're getting these tweets and you just don't know, and you're going to the store and, and people who have been afraid to show their racism are getting nastier and nastier to you and you're worried about your kids and you're worried about your sister. This is like the office that collects license fees and stuff. This is not like some SWAT team agency with frontline Wyatt Earps out there defending the streets. Uh, you tell your kids, don't be a bully. You tell your kids, don't be a bigot. Without justice, we will raise hell in America. So it's that simple. Violence gets results. He is telling his viewers to confront people who are wearing masks outdoors, to harass them. It means the risk of further violence cannot be discounted. Rooting for the new administration to fail. Now that's a threat, of course, but it's also unfortunately true. It's kind of hard to know where Republicans are at right now. And so regardless of your politics, do not listen to this man on this topic. The age of network television started in the 1940s. It first acted as a way for the government to inform the public of news from the war front, while also distracting them from it with live sports and dramatic programming. News making up the plurality of the content on television was still top dog, and over time, the news yielded us with some of the biggest names in television journalism, from David Brinkley, to Edward R. Morrow, to Frank Reynolds, even to Walter Cronkite, each of whom were not only considered to be the most trusted men on television, but in the country, with millions of people tuning in each day to the big three networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC, to see what the news had in store for them each day. The newscasts of the day rarely showcased any of the emotions or opinions of the on-air news anchors, and focused more directly on fact-based reporting in order to hold a reputation of credibility. Cronkite and Brinkley were the steady hands that guided television's journalistic integrity throughout the turbulent post-war era by comforting the country in times of hardship, such as the assassination of John F. Kennedy, while also being there to share in the moments of celebration, such as with the 1969 moon landing. But their stoic, on-air personalities didn't always match with an American society that was growing more and more complicated by the day. The news and television had no choice but to evolve. With the access to cameras becoming more widespread, unprecedented amounts of on-screen violence reached the households of millions of Americans, from the war in Vietnam to the police's violent response to the protests for civil rights in the South. There was a sea change to what could get placed on television. Competitors fueled this change as numerous channels joined the airwaves and jostled for the attention of the American audiences. Yet looming even larger in this fight for legitimacy were fights going on behind the scenes between networks and their advertisers. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. The age of ads had arrived, and with them so did cable TV. In the late 1970s, advertisers using targeted marketing and research utilized these new niche audiences on cable to pay less for ads than they normally would on network television, which as a result shifted how media was consumed. With advertisers shying away from network TV and competition becoming a threat to their channels, broadcast TV had to find another way to compete somehow. Then along came a template for the future of television, a template as well as a warning of what was to come. This is Sidney Lorette's network. Released in 1976, Network is a satire that follows a disgruntled group of employees at a fictionalized news network, UBS, trying to bump up their ratings in order to compete with their highest rated competitors. In order to do this, the network president moves to fire longtime news anchor Howard Beale, who doesn't take the decision lightly. 
In fact, during his next broadcast, whether in a fit of rage or out of serious intention, Beale says live on air that he will commit suicide on his last broadcast. Fortunately for the network, this prompts high viewership for his anticipated return. While he is given a chance to say a real goodbye and apologize for his words, in his farewell the emotionally distraught Beale laments his issues with society. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore! Whether it was the prophetic nature of Beale's outrage in relation to how TV would develop or just a coincidence that a film would tap into the emotions of television news, Network undoubtedly captures the new television landscape perfectly. It's an environment not built on the truth and accuracy of the old, but rather made to fuel ratings and profit at the detriment of the people who watch and trust the program. This meant far more entertaining, opinion-based television was more popular than the actual network news. This is seen in his antics when the network gives him his own primetime slot titled The Howard Beale Show, which resembles not a new show in which the viewer is accustomed to seeing him in, but more of a one-on-one -on -one variety format where he rants about the daily business going on around the world. Though it may seem more genuine for someone on television to speak directly to a viewer with this format, behind Beale were a bunch of greedy and cynical executives who only seem to care about the money pouring in from advertisers and the ratings the network receives each night, rather than Beale's words actual effect. Programming had Diana Christensen and News Division President Max Schumacher prove this by enabling the so-called mad prophet of the airways, regardless of the moral integrity of putting a man of his condition on television. However, his words soon gain attention as his popularity peaks and his rhetoric turns political. He convinces masses to try and stop the approval of the network's merger with the Saudi conglomerate, something the company needs to survive. Despite his influence, Beale's television show starts to show its cracks, with its populist message being tempered by executives. With the show losing its viewership and thus seeing no usefulness of Beale's presence, the network's executives secretly decide in order to pick its ratings back up, that they need to do something to get rid of Beale, and what better way to do that than to hire an assassin to kill him live on air. While not as irreverent as Adam McKay's Anchorman films, nor as grounded as James L. Brooks' broadcast news, Network falls in the middle of the best political satires of the modern age of filmmaking. The biting criticism of the news and television industry is felt immensely by the chaotic aesthetic choices made by Lumet, who chooses to overwhelm his audience with the message of corruption and politicization of mass media to evoke extreme reactions from them. The opening of the film, featuring real-life newscasters like Cronkite paired with Howard Beale, makes for a fascinating juxtaposition between the top of the journalistic ladder and the bottom, with one exemplifying professionalism and the other constantly proving he does not belong on television. Not only is this a great examination of character beyond the frame, but within the film the layering of the audio for each broadcast alongside the voiceover of the film conveys the overwhelming amount of options TV started to present in the 1970s. In 1969, however, his fortunes began to decline. He fell to a 22 share. The following year, his wife died, and he was left a childless widower with an 8 rating and a 12 share. He became morose and... Confusion arises when conflicting news outlets start to multiply, and often, it's the loudest voice in the room that prevails, which is never more true than in network with Beale and UBS. Here, the television personality is also explored with this new one-man show. In this reality TVS program, Beale stands under a spotlight with an audience cloaked in darkness. The world, when he's on camera, revolves around him, and nothing else seems to matter other than the words in his sermons. Much like a Catholic church, he's backed by a stained glass window, which exemplifies Beale's growing god complex within the film. It also exemplifies his growing role at the network and his influence that he has with his dedicated viewers. Despite his corruption by catering to the network's policies and his crazed words, as a longtime news anchor, the public begins to believe every word that comes out of his mouth with authenticity and importance. This is all true, even at the end of the film, when Beale's popularity is on the decline. In the final moments of Network, Lumet delivers a resounding conclusion, which carries through the film's end credits, with Beale being assassinated live on air as a result of the power he helped to cultivate for the once struggling Network. Deliberately choosing to keep the still frame of a dead Howard Beale on the screen throughout the entirety of the end credits, Lumet conveys the renewed obsession with violence and misfortune that Network TV and cable news has come to thrive off of today.
When examining networks' effect on the media industry as a whole, it's hard not to see the parallels between real-life news and television and the fictional ups and downs of UBS and Howard Beale. Aaron Sorkin, Oscar-winning screenwriter, noted this in a quote to the New York Times years back when he said that no predictor of the future, not even Orwell, has ever been as right as Chayefsky was when he wrote Network. Not over a year following Network's release, the Christian Broadcasting Network was launched by a now-famed conservative televangelist Pat Robertson, who has utilized his platform to promote his own political agenda, much like Beale within the film. Four years after the film's release, the first 24-hour news channel was established with CNN, which would lead to emotive talking heads bickering about pathos-based political commentary, rather than presenting the viewers with straight reporting in order to increase ratings over drier news coverage like Nightly News and Meet the Press. Even decades later, Network's prescient premonition, where a powerful populist reality television star is able to alter business decisions at the White House, somehow came true. In conclusion, while definitely at times an exaggerated satire, Network has it proven with time that its grasp on reality may not be as absurd as once was thought, with a great understanding of American culture, enough to get so many predictions regarding the fall and loss of legitimacy of today's modern-day news environment correct, Patty Chayefsky's warning should not be taken lightly. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was a labor love for me as I love the film Network. I think its contribution to society is quite striking. It's one of my favorite films about journalism and I think a lot of people need to see it today. Anyways, if you guys have any recommendations for my next video or have any thoughts about Network, comment below and share your thoughts please. I'd love to hear them. Anyway, until the next video, I'll be seeing you. Bye.